taken from the rays of the one light, weekly commentaries on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita by Swami Kriyananda. Week 12, we are children of the light. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. It is common for people to perceive themselves according to their present realities. A person in ill health says, I am ill. Few say, I am well, it is my body that is suffering. People in a low income bracket say, I am poor. Only the unusual person will say, though outwardly I live in poverty, inwardly I am wealthy. Thus, when it comes to moral and spiritual development, people commonly identify themselves with their weaknesses and their mistakes. They consider it almost a sign of humility to say, I am a sinner. Though in effect, what this means is that they identify themselves with their sinfulness, not with the soul's power to transcend all limitations in God. The great masters, including Jesus Christ, have always emphasized the divine potential of mankind. To encourage us, they address us as children of light, not of darkness. The Bible in the Gospel of St. John chapter 3 makes the point that our true home is not in the mud of this earth, but the light of heaven. No man hath ascended up to heaven, it tells us, but him that came down from heaven. This passage continues, even so the Son of Man who is in heaven, emphasizing that Jesus, though he lived on earth, is perceived by the eye of wisdom as conscious even in human form of his true reality in heavenly spheres. The way to know God is to live in godly consciousness and not to bewail our imperfections and our distance from God. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. And the Bhagavad Gita states, seekers of union with the Lord find him dwelling in their own hearts but those who, lacking in wisdom, seek him with impure motives cannot perceive him however much they struggle to do so. If you want to know God, Paramahansa Yogananda said, live in the thought that you have him already. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Oh. Those who don't know who me, or if you do know me and forgotten my name and your age is indicating that, my name is Naiswami Pranava and this is Naiswami Jyoti. And we also have Nava with us and we're from Ananda village in Northern California. And it's a very deep joy for us to be here with you. I'd like to read to you one of the prayer demands from Yogananda's Whispers from Eternity. O Spirit, beloved Father, Oversoul of the Universe, Spirit of spirits, friend of friends, teach me the mystery of my existence. Teach me to worship thee in breathlessness and in deathlessness. In the fire of devotion, burn away my ignorance. In the stillness of my soul, come, spirit, come. Possess me and teach me to feel thy immortal presence in and around me. Come, spirit, come. Come, spirit. There's a wonderful little story that I read recently about these two boys that are walking back from Sunday school and where they had this very serious talk on the devil. And the one boy says to the other, so what do you think about all this Satan stuff? And the other boy responds, well, you know, you know what happened with Santa Claus? It's probably just your dad. <laughs> If only. <laughs> 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 
But when we talk about Satan, when the yoga teachings really are emphasizing this idea of Satan and delusion, it's that which takes us away from our true home in the divine. Our true nature is lost in that way. And I think probably for many of us, for most of us, perhaps all of us here, that there have been times, there may be reoccurring times, when we just get drawn into the darkness. You know, it may be a mood, it may be some emotional situation, it may be our subconscious tendencies dragging us down. But I think we've all known in a very real way what that experience is like. And you know when you've experienced that, when you're, especially when you're in the experience, it can be all-encompassing. It can just feel like, wow, I mean, there's not much hope here. You know, pessimism seems like an uplifted state comparatively to <laughs> that experience that happens. And, you know, yeah, you all nod your head. This is real to us. But it isn't. It only appears to be real to us. And what we want to do is constantly orient ourselves in the direction that allows the light to come in. Because if we are indeed children of light, we want to be immersed in light. Because the light itself is always in a constant struggle in duality with darkness. When we look at the whole allegorical story of the Mahabharata, and specifically what's contained in the dialogue in the Bhagavad Gita between Krishna and Arjuna, it's that inner battle that's really being portrayed and revealed in the experience that they have their dialogue with. But it's our inner battle. It's, it's the battle of the forces of light with the forces of darkness. And what is easy for us to do when we're caught in darkness is to just feel that's it. Just think of simple things in your life where you get caught. I was talking with Dambara because Dambara just came back from New Zealand after being there for six or so weeks. And I was there for a few weeks prior to him going there. Uh, and we we're talking about jet lag. And if you've gone on a long distance flight, I mean, for instance, New Zealand is a straight 13 hour flight from San Francisco to Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, so it's a long flight. And I've had this experience either going to India or Italy when it's a long journey on a, on a plane. But when I went over to New Zealand uh, this time at the end of January, uh, my body was fine in a certain way, but there was this kind of mental um, kind of disease almost that happened. And I'm going to describe it as best I can. Many of you have probably experienced it, but it just felt like, uh, what am I doing here? You know, I'm not capable. <laughs> I've got this whole series of classes. What am I doing here doing this? You know, it just felt like, you know, that, that empty pit of poor me. You know, it's not going to work out. And luckily, we have two things going for us at that time, sleep and meditation. <laughs> and those are the key. The one is not to give in to sleep until it's sleep time in that time zone. But you can meditate any time. So when I arrived... Um, Kavita, our center group leader there in uh, uh, south of Auckland in New Zealand, uh, picked me up with her husband. And when we got to her place, which was an hour or so drive away, uh, she said, you want to go out and energize? <laughs> and I said, you bet. <laughs> because just to say, OK, I may not even feel the effect of energization, but the willingness to say, I'm going to tune in this way, is really that shift from that sense of darkness into a lightness. I remember years ago um, that I was ready to take a week of seclusion. And r prior to that, it was a busy week. It was a very challenging week. And um, that I was going uh, Saturday afternoon into seclusion. And the previous evening was a, uh, a lecture on how, uh, introductory lecture on how to meditate. And then Saturday was a, uh, a four-hour workshop on how to meditate. And then I was going to go in seclusion. But it was interesting. I just felt drained. I, I, I kind of just felt a collapse. Um, maybe because I knew that I had a week I didn't have to be busy outwardly. And um, I got to where I was taking a little cabin where I was taking my seclusion. 
And I was so caught by the physical exhaustion and mental exhaustion that at around 8.30, I thought, I better meditate right now because I'm not sure I can do much. And I could barely meditate for 15, 20 minutes. And here it was. I was going into a week of seclusion where I was going to med hopefully meditate many more hours every day, spend a lot more time chanting, walking, being in God's presence. And I felt like, what a start. <laughs> you know, I can barely keep my eyelids pried open going into this. And so literally, I only meditated for 20 minutes. It was about 10 to 9 that I uh, lay down in bed. And I didn't get up until 9 o'clock the next morning. I don't think, as an adult, I've done that since my teenage years, uh, slept 12 hours in one night. But you know what? What happened when I woke? The first thought was, I get to meditate. It was just like going to Disneyland. I get to do this. You know, it was like, wow. You know, because all that momentum prior to this little blip of a collapse into darkness was there to call upon, to reach towards and keep me where I wanted to go. And it was interesting, during that seclusion, I came across, a, uh, you know, on one of my walks, this little shell of a snail. And having lived here, there are many places where snails are. <laughs> Not so much in Ananda village. <laughs> but uh, its inhabitant had gone off to another plane of existence. Uh, it had left its shell. But it still smelled pretty bad. <laughs> but, but I picked it up. And, you know, it was just a tiny little uh, shell of a snail. And I looked at it, and I turned it around. And you know where the inhabitant goes into the shell, it opens up wide. And then I thought at that point, you know, that's just like the spiritual path, that if we're tuning in the right way, it just opens up literally to infinity. There's no block there. It just opens up. And then I was turning it around my hand, and then I noticed... The other part of the shell, you know, it comes up and forms like this into a point. And then I realize that's the other part of the spiritual path. We bring our focus so much together that that focus is so one-pointed, it brings us into clarity and awareness in that experience. But isn't that kind of nice to see that? That, you know, we can see the spiritual journey, the spiritual path, the spiritual experiences from a variety of different perspectives. The thing is to make them our experience. Because perspective is outside of ourselves still. It's coming from inside, but it's relating to the outside. And of course, that's how we're going to live our outer life. But we need to come to the experience where we have that expansiveness, we have that one-pointedness. And so the challenge, the invitation to all of us is to come into the light. Not just at special times, but all the time, every time, every moment, always. And that's really how we grow in the spiritual path. You know, grace, as if you were here for the first service with the uh, fire ceremony and purification, um, Daival was speaking before the purification part of the ceremony earlier about just the idea that we already are that, that, that grace is always there. It's more that, how do we open up to it? How do we make it real as an experience? And it may not always seem real to us. And this is kind of the phenomena of duality. That sometimes we convince ourselves because we don't have experiences in certain ways that we're not having them. But isn't it amazing that the conscious mind thinks it can evaluate a superconscious experience. It's like the remnants, in a sense, or the, the flow from the superconscious does come into the conscious experience. So it is touched by it. But the conscious mind itself, our conscious awareness, isn't really going to be able to fully tune into the experience of the superconscious until we really merge into being freed then every part of who we are is in that unified experience. But isn't it true, when you think about your meditations, when they happen at times, 
when they, or they don't happen, <laughs> but you're sitting there. <laughs> At least you've gotten to the point of being in front of your altar or sitting in your meditation space, but it isn't happening, seemingly, because that's what it is. It seems that it isn't happening. But this is the key here, from darkness to light, that if we endeavor, if we open up to that experience, even if we feel we're getting no traction in doing whatever techniques we're involved in, if the offering is there, if that willingness to just be moving at least in that direction, something will happen. I'm not sure if everyone here this morning uh, knows the Hong Sa technique, which Yogananda taught as a very powerful technique to bring us into deeper concentration and also bring us into stilling the breath so that we merge into that concentration, not just have it, but become that experience. But you may not have had the experience, but I've had it many times where I'm doing Hong Sa, watching the breath with that sound in and out. And it's sort of like mentally Hong Sa, Hong Sa, thought, 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 thought. Oh, that's right. I'm doing Hong Sa. <laughs> you know, and you get into Hong Sa, but still, those multiple thoughts interconnect myriad waves of thoughts just are there. But you know, the reality is of bringing light into ourselves that if we continue even after those thought, 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 thoughts come back, be in that breath, watching it with the sounds of Hong Sa, we are victorious. Isn't that amazing? We have to shift to that kind of awareness. Because life is not going to treat us with, um, gosh, here's the red carpet for you. No problem. You know, life is a breeze. Master said, an easy life is not a victorious life. Isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't mean on the hand you're going to be damaged goods and you have to be bid up to make this work. That's obviously not the opposite of it. The opposite of it is really, why evaluate and place your attachment to that darkness, to that negative experience. The teachings of yoga always emphasize that's really like just like your clothing. It may seem real that your clothing is who you are today. At least someone approaching you will say, that's such a beautiful red uh, sweater that you have on, or whatever it might be. And there's this feeling that, yeah, yeah, that's great, thank you. Uh, and you start to feel, yeah, I'm, I'm good in this blue outfit or this red sweater or whatever it is. But any of us, of course, with any sensibility, knows that's what we're wearing today. Of course, we're wearing blue every day, but anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's just what we're wearing today. It isn't who we are, obviously. But, but take something a little bit more subtle and stronger. What about pain? You know, I, I was saying to uh, Daivan Gangamata that a few days prior to coming here, I felt this odd pain in uh, some muscles just on the side and the top of my left knee. And, uh, and you know, it was just a minor thing, and I didn't pay attention to it. But uh, uh, Friday, on Saturday morning, yesterday morning, when I was doing some stretches, it really was painful. And... Now, I don't sit on a chair usually to meditate. I sit on a cushion on the floor. And it's been a long time since I've sat for a long meditation in a chair. But I had to. And I had to do it again this morning. The pain, whatever, coming out of resting overnight, maybe I slept on it weird, or, um, but I couldn't do the stretch in the normal way that I have been doing it for many decades. But there was just this little thing with that pain. This is real. Because, of course, it feels real. It's obstructing the way I've normally been doing things, including meditating. But isn't that the case with us, that we can so readily get glued to that kind of interpretation of the experience? Because is not what it is? Is it the experience? Or is it the interpretation of the experience? Well, it's kind of both. 
But where we get hooked, where we get attached, is when we identify with the interpretation of that experience. So that gives us a great clue. That gives us the possibility, coming from that perspective, of always moving in the right direction. And so when we really focus on how we draw this light, the yoga teachings bring us a lot of possibilities. One is to really feel that we're always expanding that inner expansion of joy under all situations, under all circumstances, all the time. That how do, what are we doing with our orientation? You know, is joy just something that we're waiting to have happen for us, to us? It could be a long time before you have that experience if you're approaching it that way. But if we approach it more that I'm in joy and I'm offering myself more fully in joy, then joy is us. Joy isn't happening to us. Joy is our experience. It is who we are. You know, the uh, I'm looking for the joy symbol. Jyoti has this one of your eyesight is super <laughs> laser-like. But you know what it's, the, the logo. For some of you that are new may not know what it is, but it's something that came to Swami Kriyananda in a vision or in meditation. But it's these sweeping lines that come up. And then there's a movement of a line going around and going up and then around again and coming back down and going up again and then coming down where it's like the wings of a bird, of a dove coming down to that peak. And the, the phrase that Swami Kriyananda used with that visual logo is joy is within you. And it's a nice affirmation. I mean, we use it sometimes in greeting. That's a nice way to connect. But it's also, in a sense, a command. <laughs> you know, it's like saying, tune in here. Joy is within you. Come on, bring that awareness. That's the invitation. That's the gift that's always there. And so all we find some way, under all circumstances, as I said, where we take that opening and make it real. And it may be, remember as I said, that we may not feel it's happening. Like what I said about Hong Sa, that, that meditation technique, that we may not feel this is worthy for me to continue meditating. Maybe I should go get ice cream. That might be a better uplifting experience. But as we just continue in that offering, we may not be able to recognize it. But it is happening. It's like watching your hair grow. It's not what we are able to really see. You know, I mean, I usually wait till it's in my eyes, and then I, oh yeah, I need to get a haircut. But it's happening all the time, and we're just not paying attention to it. And so it's not so much we have to always say, okay, I'm meditating and paying attention that way. What I'm really referring to is it's more the offering in meditation. I can always do that in the midst of whatever challenge is there. And sometimes we get beaten up in that immediate interaction with a challenge. It just seemingly overpowers us, and we feel we're just struck to the ground from the energy of that negativity or whatever it is, and we know what that's like. But that doesn't mean we have to buy into that's who we are, as I said before. All we need to do is say, how do I open up to this experience? So always finding some way to be in the experience of joys within you. But then there's also the power of tuning into expanding Still, I have to have good eyesight from the back. <laughs> nice, thank you. <clears throat> Show and tell. Um, but we also, if we really want to bring that light in, if we can expand our 
inner calmness, that inner peace. You know, sometimes on the spiritual path, we can just get so busy because there's so much that is there to tune into, to do, to be um, what's known in the Sanskrit terms, seva yogis. Yogis being yogis. Seva means, in a sense, selfless service. And sometimes you'll hear the word karma yogis because uh, karma refers to action. But the idea that we're doing these things, and, and all of us know what it's like when the busyness overwhelms us and we're just busy, almost for the sake of being busy. Um, but if we always, again, have a reference point of expanding our inner calmness and peace, then it's not a matter of reducing the busyness, it's changing what's happening at that moment along what we're doing that seemingly is busy. We're always bringing it back to our center. And that phrase of Yogananda, center everywhere, circumference nowhere. Meaning that once we're in that center, and really when you think of calmness and peace, this almost gives us an immediate experience of just even visualizing that, then we are in that center. And really, there's no boundaries to the amount of energy we can place into whatever service, whatever areas that we're involved in outwardly. That can be just grace happening because we've come from the point inside that's very real for us. And so always try to find that stillness and calmness. You know, at the suggestion of Swami Kriyananda, many of us, before we endeavor to do our activities of the day, uh, just pray and meditate. So uh, Jyoti, Nava, and I at the Ananda uh, Worldwide Sangha offices at Ananda Village, we start Monday through Friday each day gathering who's ever around. And there's about 40 people in the building. Not everyone comes all the time. But we just, for five minutes, we just do a simple prayer. We meditate for three or four moments, and then we do healing prayers. And it works for us as a group, no doubt. And it's a nice way to interconnect and make sure we're all lifting the energy. But really, for us individually, it's even more important to do it with whether we're in a group or not, if we're just there alone. Um, have some way that allows you to be in the center so that you have no boundaries for that experience of the divine. The other thing I think for all of us, and it almost seems so more important at this time in what's happening in the world around us, is to expand our compassion, to expand our care for the world around us. Um, you know, to really feel we're very clear being instruments to share blessings. And I don't mean, you know, of course, I think none of us would do this. You know, the idea that I'm going to bless you in a specific way because you need to be blessed, otherwise you're not saved. It's not that that we're emphasizing. It's just that grace is there, as we've said. And if we can feel compassion, and what is compassion? Compassion understood in, in a deep way is the heart's natural ability to open up and share the blessings, whether it be of love or grace or healing energy that we are tuning into, to whatever degree. If we feel we're new on the path and we feel, I don't even understand this, but I'm going to try this, that will happen through you. That will take place. That will be a, a channel that you're acting as for other people. But that compassion is really what keeps us personally engaged in tuning into divine love. Because divine love can seem ethereal at times. But if we're always opening ourselves, acting as an instrument with compassion to care with this divine love, we will be changed. Yogananda had that phrase, I think most of us have heard, that the instrument is blessed by that which flows through it. It's by moving to that openness that we are blessed. And of course, then we have this blessing going out into the world around us. It's not that it's selfish or self-contained. 
naturally. That's an experience that's shared. And when we start doing that, it's more readily available to us that we respond in that way when we think that jerk next door is doing something he shouldn't be doing. We don't call him a jerk to begin with. Um, we call him our neighbor. You know, we call him our friend. And we're able to see that, yeah, his behavior is not appropriate, and maybe I need to say something to this person. But we're engaging, we're endeavoring to include, even in an exchange like that, compassion, care, a flow of that divine love to touch other people. When we're in these experiences, then light is there. The light shineth through us. And we're no longer waiting for that experience. We're not thinking it's somewhere out there that will happen to me. It is who I am. It is the fulfillment of who I am. And it's a fulfillment for all of us to be in that experience. So let us open up to being children of the light and just feel that radiating out everywhere at all times. Be in that bliss. Let's take a moment to meditate. I am not free.